Amen. First of all, that was pretty good. So you never want to have to read chapters that have genealogies in them. <laughs> so I, I, I struggle with pronouncing things even uh, to this day. But yeah, that was pretty good. So good job there. Anyway, so we see the genealogy of Joseph in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to focus on the last um, half of that. We're looking at the Christmas story in the, the next few weeks, in the, uh, the past uh, week. We're looking at the Christmas story, the run-up to the birth of Christ, see what we can learn um, from this tonight. Um, of course, last week we talked about Elizabeth. We talked about Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, who is, uh, she's with child. She's with child with John the Baptist. And we looked at um, the prophecy there of, you know, turning the hearts, the father's hearts towards the children and the children's heart towards the fathers, which was the purpose of John the Baptist, because in order to accept Christ, the reason that that, that prophecy was there and the reason that it was in the Old Testament in Malachi and the reason that it was repeated um, to um, Elizabeth as to be the purpose of John the Baptist's life was because if you have the proper attitude, if you have the proper heart towards your heavenly father, your heavenly father is about to send the savior of the world. Um, so if your heart is right towards the heavenly father, you will accept Jesus Christ. So that's why we looked, what we looked at last week. Tonight, we're going to focus on um, Elizabeth's cousin, of course, Mary. So we're going to look at Mary tonight. Turn back to Luke chapter 1. Keep your place in Matthew chapter 1. We're going to look at Mary. We're going to look at um, just the, the life of Mary, the interaction, I guess not the life of Mary, but the interaction um, in this time with Elizabeth and Mary and see what we can take um, from this. I believe that um, the verses we're going to look at tonight, Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 1, tell us the most about the kind of person that Mary was. Um, so we'll take a look at that. We'll look at um, kind of, you know, how people have twisted Mary and some things, falsehoods that are talked about um, with Mary. But I believe that these two passages in the Bible, Luke chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1, really give us, um, you know, they give us a testimonial on, on who um, this young lady was in the Bible and why the things happened to her that happened to her. Look at Luke chapter 1 and look down at verse number 26. Um, this evening. And in the sixth month, the Bible says, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth. So this isn't the sixth, this isn't June. This is talking about, um, remember Elizabeth, she hid herself in the verses before she hid herself five months when she was pregnant. Of course, she is an older um, woman where she's much older than Mary. Um, she was an older woman. It was, it was miraculous that she was um, with child. Um, but of course, um, that happened um, through the hand of God. But she's in the sixth month of her pregnancy here, and the angel Gabriel at this point was sent from God unto a different city, okay? The angel of God was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So Gabriel's the same angel that visits Mary that visited her cousin Elizabeth, okay? To a virgin espoused, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and, to the, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her, this is Gabriel, and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. So basically, the angel is telling Mary, he comes to her and he says, you know, you are very favored with God. You are very, um, you're very blessed. He, he just tells her the, the situation that, what does he tell her? He tells her how God feels towards her. Right? Again, remembering this morning's sermon, does he go and he tell, does he go and tell Mary like how great she is? No, he says, you're highly favored, you're very blessed. You know, God, you know, basically, you know, you are in, in the right standing with God, and, you know, you're very blessed. And Mary will repeat this. We'll see. She'll repeat this um, later on in our sermon this evening. When she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be, this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. Again, just saying how um, favored she is with the Lord. And behold, that thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. Verse 33, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Of course, this is, he's telling her that this is going to be the fulfillment of the prophecy in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where David is told, remember 2 Samuel chapter 7, um, David wants to build a house for the Lord. David wants to, he goes and he tells Nathan, I want to build a temple for the Lord. David had a great house to live in. He's like, but the ark is in a tent. 
and he wants to build a house for the Lord. And then Nathan ends up coming back to David saying, no, your son's going to build the house. However, in verse 16, he tells him, your kingdom basically will have no end, prophesying, prophesying that the Messiah will come through the line of David. And then, of course, we see that actually happen in history as the kingdoms split a gener two generations after David, and then the northern kingdom is just dynasty after dynasty after dynasty after dynasty, different families just destroying each other, wiping each other out. But the, nor the lower kingdom of Judah is always a son of David, son of David, son of David, son of David, the whole way through. Okay, and then we see it um, culminate with Christ, and then, of course, Christ takes that kingdom into eternity, all right, because his kingdom will have no end. So, I mean, David, you know, he, he knew that the Messiah was coming from him because that's the only way that a man's kingdom could have no end is if the Messiah was taking it into eternity because, as we know from the stories of the kings, kings do not reign forever. Many of them reign for a very short period of time, all right? So, look at verse number 34. So we see that prophecy, Gabriel tells Mary, hey, prophecy is going to be fulfilled through your child. Mary doesn't understand. She says, Mary said unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? She's saying, I am a virgin. I have never been with a man. How could I have a child? Verse 35. And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Now turn back to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. So the angel tells her that, you know, it's going to be a miraculous event. You're not going to know a man, and you are going to be with child. It's going to be God's son. All right, look at Matthew chapter 1 and verse number 18. Go back to Matthew chapter 1. Look at verse number 18. So the angel Gabriel, after talking with Elizabeth, goes, goes and tells Mary this great miracle that's going to be used um, that she's going to be used um, for. She's going to be the mother of the Messiah of Jesus Christ. Look at verse number 18 of Matthew chapter 1. I love, you know, Matthew chapter 1, Luke chapter 1. We get different, um, kind of different details, as the Bible always does, especially in the Gospels. Verse 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So we see that this event that Gabriel talked to Mary about has now happened, and this is how it actually went down. In verse number 18, um, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, notice um, in verse 18 um, that word espoused. She was espoused to Joseph. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Put her away privily, meaning privately, quietly, not making a big deal about it. Now to understand um, these two verses, we kind of need to understand, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 22, we need to understand the difference between uh, marriage and espousal, or what the Old Testament will call betrothal in the Bible. So Mary was espoused to Joseph, but she had not physically come together um, with Joseph. But notice in verse number 19, I'll just read it for you if you're not there, you're turning to Deuteronomy chapter 22, but notice she was espoused to him meaning they weren't married at that point yet, but they were espoused or betrothed, as the Old Testament would call it. But in verse number 19, it says Joseph, her husband. So Joseph is still considered her husband, even though they are espoused. Okay, look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 23. And then you're going to keep your place in Deuteronomy 22, because we're going to come back there um, in just a few minutes. The Bible says, If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then, verse 24, she shall, they shall bring them both out of the gate of the city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the, in the city, and the man, because he had humbled his neighbor's what? His neighbor's wife. Okay, so basically what I'm trying to get you to understand is this betrothal, this um, espousal in the Bible, is she is considered his wife, and he is considered her husband in the Bible. Okay? So thou shalt put evil from amongst you. So, I mean, the Bible is considering this situation in Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 23 and 24. It's considering even if two people were espoused to each other, betrothed to each other, and they would go lie with somebody else, they, the Bible considers that adultery. Okay, and that's the, the punishment that you see here in Deuteronomy chapter 22. So basically all that to say this, an espousal or a betrothal 
is, is a promise to Mary, but that promise is as good as marriage, as far as the rules of physically, you know, being with someone else, all right? That, that, you know, and it depends on the culture, you, who you talk to, what you read. These betrothals, these espousals could have lasted for months, they could have lasted for years, but the point is, it's before the couple physically comes together as husband and wife, but it is considered marriage. Okay, that's what you have to understand when you read the Bible as compared to like what we do today. Okay, so when you read the Bible, you just kind of have to remember that it's a different culture here than what we're living in today. There is no modern equivalent in the United States to espousal to betrothal. Okay. I mean, we have like this modern day engagement or whatever you call that, you know, uh, which basically amounts to there's fornication before the engagement, there's fornication during the engagement, and then, then the, the engagement breaks off or whatever. And the engagement lasts for, you know, eight years or whatever. You know what I mean? It just doesn't mean anything today. So the, the Bible is obviously speaking of something very different, a very different culture than what we see being exercised um, in our country. I'm sure in other places of the world there is betrothal, there is um, espousal in other places of the world. Now, go to Matthew chapter 5. So we see uh, this is all in context of Joseph, all right? He was espoused to this woman. She became with child of the Holy Ghost, and he was, he was you know, minded to put her away privily. He was, he was going to put her away, meaning he was going to divorce her. Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 31. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 31. The Bible says, it had, been, it had been said that whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. The only point I want to make here is that putting away equals divorce. They're, what they're talking about as far as putting away means, you know, getting a divorce. All right? So he was, again, proving that this, this espousal is as good as marriage, meaning if he would put her away, you know, it's, it's like they're divorced. Okay? But I say unto you that whosoever, look at verse 32, whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. So a lot of people are confused when Jesus will come in and say, it hath been said of them of old time, and then Jesus will say something else. And a lot of people think that don't know the Bible you know, very well and want to misquote the Bible or have a different version of the Bible, many people will say, well, Jesus is changing the rules. But Jesus is not changing the rules. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. He says, I am come to, not to destroy, but to fulfill, Jesus said. He's not coming to, Jesus is the word. He is not going to contradict the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, anywhere. All right, he's simply reiterating what the Bible said. I mean, these people were so far from the Word of God that he's just reiterating what it was supposed to be in the first place. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 22. So Jesus basically said that, that you know, not only did he define putting away as divorcement, but he's saying that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. So you say, that's weird. I mean, fornication is... Like fornication is, you know, being, you know, two people being in a physical relationship outside of marriage. So how could that possibly have to do with divorcement? Well, Deuteronomy chapter 22 explains exactly what Jesus is talking about. Look at Deuteronomy 22 and verse number 13. The Bible says, if any man take a wife and go into her, go in unto her and hate her. Again, remember what hate means, we find that Wednesday, extremely dislike, <laughs> right? If anybody tells you that they don't extremely dislike anything or anyone, they're lying to you, all right? So he goes into her and he, he just doesn't like her. He doesn't want her as a wife anymore. And you say, why? And give occasions of speech against her. And then he starts talking against her. So something's clearly happened here, right? Something has clearly happened where he wanted to marry this woman, then they, they went in to come together as husband and wife, and now he doesn't want to be... Uh, married to her anymore. He doesn't like her anymore. All right. Then shall the father, he says, and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman. And when I came unto her, I found her not a maid, uh, not a maid, meaning not pure, not a virgin. Like she had been with someone else before, like she had done what? Committed fornication. Okay. 
Look at verse 15. So then she's automatically guilty and she's, you know, no. Then there's a, sort of a trial of some sorts. Uh, verse 15, the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity unto the elders of the gate in the city. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. I'm not going to explain verse 15. You can ask your parents about that, um, no matter how old you are. I won't explain that from the pulpit. But basically, um, there's supposed to be evidence that she is pure and that she has not committed fornication. And the father, you know, it's, it's her dad that's standing up for her, by the way. It's her dad that is defending, you know, her honor, so to speak. And they go to the leaders of the city. I gave my daughter unto this man to wife, and he hateth her. He, he, all of a sudden, he doesn't like her anymore. Verse 17. And lo, he had given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid, and yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city, and the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. And they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver and give unto them the father of the damsel and give them to the father of the damsel because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. And she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. So in this case, he went to, in this case right here, as far as I've read it, this guy goes to the elders of the city. He's accusing this woman that he's married to this girl that he's been married to of, you know, a fornication in the past or whatever, saying she wasn't a maid, she claimed she was, she wasn't, and he was wrong. And in this case, it's the man who's chastised. It's the man who's chastised, he has to pay a fine, and he has to remain, they have to remain married. So they, they say, no, you cannot put away your wife. The divorce is like canceled, all right? And they say, no, she shall be his wife, and he may not put her away all his days. Now, it's interesting here because what we see, the next couple verses will seem like very harsh to people that read it, especially people that are caught up in just, you know, any culture of the day. But notice in verse 19 how valued a, a maid, a woman that is pure is. It says that this guy is chastised because he brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel. This is a nation. This is a nation here, the nation of Israel any godly nation, this is a nation that values its purity, values its women, values its women's purity, values women, period. I mean, we are so far, so the next couple verses talk about that, you know, if she is, was the one that was lying, then she goes out and she's to be stoned, and all this, and people will say, well, man, that seems harsh. But you have to understand today that we live in a society that we live in a nation, we live in a culture that completely devalues women. So before you go and start, you know, criticizing the culture of the Bible, look around you. We live in a society that completely devalues young ladies, young girls, and just it throws, tries to teach them to not be pure, tries to teach them that, you know, marriage is nothing, that fornication is okay, and there's no shame in how you look or how you act. It teaches the men the same thing. But the point is, the nation of Israel here, they valued their virgins. They valued their women and they valued their purity. It's like they were mad at this guy because they were like, look, you accused a virgin of this nation? Like, like she's some crown jewel. She's some, she's some prize. But isn't that what the Bible says? Isn't that what the Bible says when you see, like, the virtuous woman is compared to, like, rubies in Proverbs chapter 31? Isn't that what the Bible says when it talks about a woman that is of a meek and quiet spirit, is of great value to the Lord? I mean, this is the culture of the Bible, is to value young women, is to value purity, value, you know, just chasteness. But that's the opposite of what we have today. Yet people will read something like this and say, oh, that's, that's so harsh, right? That's so harsh. We're so far from God's law today. I mean, you pretty much have to just do like a, like a format on yourself. You just got to reformat yourself. You know, just do a quick format on yourself and just realize that everything that we've been taught is wrong. You know, as you get saved and you start reading the Bible, you just got to be like, no, I'm not going to be influenced by all of this other garbage we talked about this morning. I mean, Psalm 14, 14 talks about how just, you know, the psalmist says, thou makest us a reproach 
to our neighbors. You know, so here we are saying, I don't like that harshness in the Bible. I don't like the way that is, but we're a reproach. We're a joke. We're a joke the way we do things. The nation of Israel became a joke to the psalmist in Psalm 14. The Bible, it even says, it even says thou, makest, thou makest us a byword amongst the heathen. Like, even the heathen were making fun of them in Psalm 14. Even the heathen, the heathen laugh at us today. You know, the heathen laugh at us today. So, point being, back to the sermon, before we say, oh, you know, I don't like the way that this sounds. Look, look, our culture is, is it's become a byword. We've become a byword to people because of our culture. And the point is, if she was guilty, the Bible is saying she hurt the nation. She hurt the purity of the other you know, ladies in that nation. Go to Matthew chapter 19. So, fornication. Fornication is the only cause. So, the man in Deuteronomy chapter 22, you know, if she was guilty of fornication, that was taken care of. But if she was not guilty, the divorce was not granted. So, they remained married. And they had to remain married his whole life. It's like, no, you... And why is that? Because here... He went in and, and they came together physically and now she wasn't a maid anymore and he's supposed to just throw her off to the wayside? No, that was a nation that valued her. That was a nation that valued that purity for her husband. Is, and that nation is saying, no, you're not just going to throw that away. You're not just going to walk away from that. That's why fornication is the only cause. Doesn't it make sense when you think about it from a biblical purity standpoint? That two people should like, I don't know, just like, Two people should come together and, like, be virgins when they get married. I mean, like, what? But that is the way the Bible says it should happen. And fornication is the only cause. But since there's no betrothal today, you can see where I'm going with this. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Look at Matthew chapter 19. Look at verse number 1. Fornication is the only cause. And we see that it has direct influence that fornication has to do with, it ties directly in that idea of betrothal or espousal that is basically marriage. It's, it's looked at the same as marriage. Look at Matthew chapter 19, verse number 1. The Pharisees are trying to catch Jesus here. In verse number 1 it says, And it came to pass, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he departed from Galilee, and he came into the coast of Judea beyond Jordan. And great multitudes followed him, and he healed them there. The Pharisees also came up to him, unto him, tempting him and saying unto him, is it lawful for a man to put his wife away for any cause, for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? I mean, he's always saying that. That ye which made them at the beginning, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain. You know what that means? That means two, first of all. They twain shall become one flesh. It was never God's plan for a man to have 600 wives. It was never God's plan for a man to have multiple wives. It's like, but men just went and did these things. This is what you have to understand. Like, God has to manage this mess. He has to manage what, you know, he's like, I told you what to do. He's like, you know, twain should be one flesh. And then a guy goes out and gets married 600 times. He's, God's like, ugh. Now what do I do? You know, so the point is, it was two people get married, and they're one flesh, all right? And then it says in verse 6, wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. So they're not, they're not, they're not two anymore. They're one. They're one. So, we're, and, and who put the, who made them one? See, this is the key, right? Who made the two, the man and his wife, who made the husband and wife one? God did. Now, like, you think about things that God made. You think about things that God seals. Think about things that God keeps. Who can break that apart is what the Bible is trying to say here. It says, Jesus is explaining this, and he says, they're, no, they're but one flesh, wherefore what God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And then they came at him and they said, well, well. They say unto him, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So Jesus is trying to explain here, hey, just because people were divorcing themselves during the time of Moses doesn't mean that's what God wants. Doesn't mean that's what God's plan was. It was just, that was just Moses being pragmatic. That was just Moses trying to 
take care of people that went through a terrible situation and were doing the wrong thing. Look at verse number 9. And then he repeats um, what he said. He said, And I said unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. Jesus didn't change the rules here. This is the way it always was. This is the way it always was. Jesus is just like resetting them, reminding them. Just because you messed up as a nation and you were doing wicked things, that's not what God wanted. And whosoever marrieth her which is putteth away doth, doth commit adultery. I mean, so look, the Bible says in Malachi 2.16 that God hateth putting away. God extremely dislikes divorce. You know, you may have to just use that from now on, you know, so it doesn't sound so hateful. But God extremely, God hates divorce, the Bible says. You know, I mean, that kind of like, that kind of puts outside the, the realms of possibility this idea of no-fault divorce today, does it not? I mean, doesn't everyone want to say that, oh, you know, I, I, you know, I got divorced, but it wasn't my fault. You know, I got divorced, but, you know, she was wicked. Or I got divorced, but he was wicked. But the Bible is saying, like, there's, there's no equivalent to espousal today, so it's kind of like there's no real excuse for divorce. I mean, you think about, oh, what about adultery? Well, the Old Testament had a, had a solution for that, too. I mean, in the Old Testament, if we were to follow that, there would be no, like, oh, what, my, you know, my husband committed adultery on me or my wife committed adultery on me because at that point, you'd be a widow. <laughs> it's pretty simple, you know? I mean, but if you don't follow the Bible, you end up, you, you can almost see how Moses ended up where he was. Because if you don't file, follow exactly what God's law is, you end up in all these weird halfway situations where you have to deal with this somehow. And Jesus is just like walking you back to the law. That's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is just walking you back. Like, hey, let's just go back to the way it was supposed to be. All right? Now, here's another interesting point. When it comes to divorce... Probably one of the most wicked things that new Bible versions do is give justification for divorce. I gave, I gave a sermon a, a few weeks back or a few months back on just things in the NIV that are just crazy and completely nuts. Like, you know, you have to marry your rapist and all this crazy stuff in the NIV. Like, why would anyone have this Bible? But here's the thing. The NIV completely opens the floodgates for divorce. Like, if you want to get divorced, you better get rid of your King James Bible, and you better get an NIV. That's step one. Step one, I want out of this marriage, get an NIV. Because then, you know, it'll just, it just gives you permission. I'll read for you Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 8. You look down at your King James Bible in Matthew chapter 19 and verse number 8 and verse number 9. I'm going to read for you the NIV version. All right? In verse number 8 of Matthew 19, it says, Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. You're like, okay, that's pretty close. But it was not this way from the beginning. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, are you reading your King James Bible right now? Anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another, this, and marries another woman commits adultery. So it turns fornication into sexual immorality. Now turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. You're like, okay, what's, what's sexual immorality? I mean, what's that? Well, Jesus kind of defines that for us, all right? Look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 28. I'll wait for you to get there because it's, it's, uh, it's important that you see this. But basically, I mean, you think these changes are on accident. You think these changes, they are subtle, but subtlety is never good, and it's usually not on accident. All right, look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 28. Jesus says, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So look, Jesus is pretty clearly explaining here that looking at a woman and lusting after a woman is immoral. Lusting after a woman, looking at someone and lusting after her is, you know, if you're a married man and you go and you look upon another woman that's not your wife and you lust after her, you know, you're committing adultery with her in your heart. Now, obviously, he's not equating these two things. Jesus is never saying, like, this is equal, because people will do this stupid thing, too. This is the, you know, all sins are equal crowd. They'll say, oh, well, looking, uh, you know, uh, walking by a, a, you know, woman and looking twice or something is just as bad as committing adultery on your wife, like, actually doing it. I mean, that's ridiculous. Jesus is saying it's a sin. That's what he's saying. He's saying 
to lust after, uh, you know, another woman, a married woman, you know, if you're married, you know, all, or whatever, both sides, is immorality. So the point is, is if you take that, what Jesus said there, and combine it with the NIV verse, like, basically a wife could divorce her husband biblically in the NIV for looking at, you know, the Sports Illustrated on the checkout of the, the grocery store or whatever. I don't know if they have those there. But the point is, sexual immorality is, is, is a broad spectrum. Whereas the Bible says that divorce is only to be granted in this very specific case of fornication in the espousal period that doesn't even exist today. So, King James Bible, you have to stay married forever. NIV, whatever. Whenever you want to walk out the door, walk out the door. Because every man will be guilty of that at some point in his life of some kind of lust or some kind of, you know, you know, look, and you should work on those things and get, get those things out of your life. But it is certainly not cause for divorce. And I mean, you see how wicked these modern Bible versions are. I mean, think about it. Like, oh, what's the big deal? It could literally ruin your life. It could literally ruin the life of generations of your family. Why? Because you don't have God's word. That's why it's not God's word. It's that simple. Go back to Luke chapter 1. So all that to say this, Joseph, Joseph, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 1. Go back to Matthew chapter 1. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 that Joseph was a just man. He was a just man. Look at verse 19 of Matthew chapter 1. Joseph was following the proper rules. And not only that, but Joseph didn't want to do what the man in Deuteronomy 22 did. Joseph... He wasn't going to take Mary and go, between, go to the elders of the city. Instead, he just wanted to just, like, he cared about her too much. He, did it, he, was, he, was, he was too good of a man to throw her under the bus, even though it was quite clear to him at that moment in time that she had committed fornication. Okay? But look at verse 19. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. He could have done it. It was his right to make her a public example. That's exactly what happened in Deuteronomy chapter 22. And I would think that in that court case, if the woman that is brought before the elders of the city is actually with child, I would think that it would be a short trial at that point. But that's why God steps in here in the very next verse. But look at verse number 20. So the point is, Joseph... He, he was within his rights. He was doing what was okay, what was right, right? And in a better way, showing his character to, even though he had the right to kind of be public, he was going to just do it quietly. Look at verse number 20. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which interpreted is God with us. So the angel steps in and talks to Joseph. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him. Now that shows you something about Joseph right there. Like, I mean, think about this. Think about this. Here's an, he's, he's married to this woman. He's espoused to this woman. She becomes pregnant. She becomes pregnant. And then in a dream, the angel of the Lord tells him what's going on. It shows you that his heart was right with his father in heaven too. Because right away, he just accepts it right there. And right away, he just gets moving on with the plan. You start to think, like, maybe there is a reason God chose these two <laughs> to do this. Right? There was no, are you sure? Or I'm going to need another vision. You know, I'm going to need two or three visions like many people in the Bible did. But look, Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took, him his, took unto him his wife and knew her not until she brought forth her firstborn son and called his name Jesus. Go back to Luke chapter 1. So he knew her not until. There's a lot of things about Mary that were talked about that aren't, that aren't true either. Mary had a normal marriage with Joseph. You know, it knew or not until Jesus was born, but then they came together physically. They had a normal marriage. They had children. Um, the Bible is very clear about that. Now, let's look at Mary's interaction 
with her cousin Elizabeth here, because this is very interesting. Look at verse number 36. Verse number 36 of Luke chapter 1. So Mary visits Elizabeth like right after this conception. So Jesus is basically, Jesus is like six months, somewhere in there, six months younger than John the Baptist, okay? And so she visits, she's conceived. Um, just a few days after this angel visits her, she goes and she visits Elizabeth, and Elizabeth is in the sixth month of her pregnancy. But look at the verse number 36. We see a lot about Mary here. And behold, my, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also, this is the angel still, conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. So the Bible, I mean, Gabriel's saying, like, look, we performed, a, I performed, God performed a miracle with your cousin too, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, now this is Mary talking now, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word, and the angel departed from her. You know what handmaid means? Handmaid, handmaid means female servant. Mary basically says, I'm your servant. Whatever you want. And the angel departed from her. And Mary rose, verse 39, in those days and went into the hill country with haste in the city, into, the, into a city of Judah and entered in the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence this is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. So first of all, there's this interesting little side note here. Basically, Mary comes in and says hello to the family, and Elizabeth's baby, like, jumps in her womb. Why? Because she heard the voice of Mary. And the baby, and then Elizabeth, like, you're like, well, what was it? Maybe it was just saying a voice or whatever. But then in verse number 44, it says, the babe leaped. Why did the babe leap? She was filled with the Holy Ghost. This is literally the Holy Ghost speaking through her at this point. And she says, the babe leaped in my womb for joy, proving that, you know, babies experience feelings. Right there. Babies experience feelings. This baby, John the Baptist, experienced joy in the womb. That's what the Bible says. You know, look, even science knows this, by the way. <laughs> even science knows this. I mean, secular scientists have gone and they've done all kinds of tests and studies on how babies can recognize their mother's voice. They, it makes a difference with them. Let me just read you one little test um, that I read about on parenting.com. There's tons of these out there, by the way. But let me, let me just, I mean, science knows this. Science knows that babies in the womb experience joy, feelings, and they can recognize voices, especially the voice of their mother. Listen to this test. Perhaps the most significant noise or, or sound a baby hears in utero is his mother's voice. This is from parenting.com, a secular, you know, obviously a secular publication. Around the seventh and eighth months, a fetus heart rate slows down significantly whenever his, mouth, his mother is speaking, indicating that the mom's voice has a calming effect. By the time they're born, babies can actually recognize their mother's voice. In one study, doctors gave day-old infants pacifiers that were connected to tape recorders. Depending on the baby's sucking patterns, the pacifiers either turned on a tape of their mother's voice or that of an unfamiliar woman's voice. The amazing result, within 10 to 20 minutes, the babies learned to adjust their sucking rate on the pacifier to turn on their own mother's voice. I mean, this is an interesting little test, but the point is, like, this is why, you know, moms will, you know, they'll sing to their babies, and they're, because, like, they know. They know that, like, I mean, first of all, moms can feel their babies moving when they talk to them, you know, pushing back when the babies kick, and all these types of things. I remember, I mean, just as a farmer, I mean, I remember, I mean, just, just as a, a natural thing in God's creation, the last, the last year we were on the we had about 180 lambs. That's a lot of lambs. And they all just like, it sounds like a bunch of babies screaming. If you've ever been around a lot of lambs. And we would twice a day, this was my favorite part of the day, twice a day we would give moms, the ewes, we would give them grain in these feeders. And at that point was the only time that the moms, and each mom usually had two lambs. They usually had twins, sometimes triplets. 
But when the moms would feed, they would leave their babies. So here you had a situation where we would go and we would dump grain in these feeders, and all the moms would leave the babies. And all the lambs would get together like a bunch of little kids. They would just get in, and we called it the lamb gang. They would get in this lamb gang, and they would just run circles around the barn, and they would play around. But within like seven, eight minutes, all the moms were done eating. And what the mom sheep would do is they would just go, and they would just go, Bleh. and all the lambs would just start screaming. And you're like, how? It, it just sounded like chaos. But they would just beep to each other, ba to each other, and each one would find their own lamb through the sound of the lamb's voice. Even though the lamb, they all sound the same to us, but to the mother, the mother could hear the lamb's voice. And then they would find their lamb, and then they would smell their lamb and know it was theirs. You know, just do a double check there. But the point is, it was just through their voice. That's just animals. Imagine us. Imagine us. The point is that babies can experience feelings and joy. Here's the thing, because they're people, because they're human beings. You know, so science, I mean, if you're, all these people that are for, I mean, you're, just admit that you're for murder. Just say, hey, I think we should be able to murder these children. Just be honest about it because science is against you on every single turn. There is no other place in the process from conception to birth where someone could become a human naturally, even though DNA says they become a human right at conception. Everything in science says that they are in their own human being the entire time. They experience feelings. They experience joy. You can see them suck their thumb when there is an actual, you know, something in there trying to kill them. They try to get away. They experience pain. It's the most terrible thing in the world to even think about, but it happens every day thousands of times. So look, I mean, just admit that you're for murder, but that's not the point. Who was Mary? Let's come back to the sermon. Luke chapter 1 and verse number 45. But you see how there's all these little tidbits of information in the Bible that we can just use to apply to the, the clown world of today, as we were talking about? I mean, it is truly just, the wisdom is all in the Bible. Look at Luke chapter 1 and verse number 45. So who was Mary? Who was Mary? And blessed, this is Elizabeth, this is Elizabeth talking to Mary, just talking about how the babe leapt in her womb, verse 45, and blessed is she that believed. Why is Mary in heaven, by the way? Because she believed. Why is any Old Testament, well, I mean, are we not still in the Old Testament with Mary here at this point? I mean, she is saved the same way that Abraham was saved, the same way that you are saved, because she believed God. It's that simple. And blessed is she that believed. She believed God's promise. Her heart was right towards the Lord. And when God came and he told her what he was going to do, she accepted it just like that. For there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, I am awesome. Verse 46. Look what she said. She said, she's like, I am the greatest. I was chosen. I'm the chosen one. But look what she, this is who Mary is right here. She says, my soul doth magnify the Lord. Remember the mirror this morning? What do we do? What do we do? What's our job as Christians? To magnify the Lord. That's it. That's the whole duty right there. She said, my soul doth magnify the Lord. and My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. She's such a great mirror. She's such a great reflection of the glory of God of God, this young lady. This young lady. She's probably not even 18. She's probably not even 20. She's a very young lady. For he hath regarded, and look, at, and look this is her self-esteem. This is Mary's self-esteem in verse 48. This is what she thinks about herself. And she's not telling you this to tell you about herself. She's just, you can just tell what she feels about herself in verse number 48. This is what people will call self-esteem today. He hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And she's not saying they'll call me blessed like they'll worship my statue. She's saying all, she's like, I am, I'm just this lowly servant, she says, and everybody in the history of mankind going forward and even the saints in heaven are going to look at me and realize how God blessed me. She's appreciating her blessings here. It's very simple. But you, show, you, you just, 
have, it's regarded the low, he has regarded the lowest state of his, of his handmaid, of his servant. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed the strength in his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down, turn to Luke 14, chapter 11, as I read this verse to you. And let's bring this thing from this morning full circle. She says, he hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Does that sound familiar? What did he do? Luke 14, verse number 11. Luke 14 and verse number 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. She's basically quoting Jesus' words right there. She's basically saying, like, he'll put down the mighty from their seats. Like, you go and you sit in that high seat, you're going to be put down. But the, exalt, the, the low seats, the people that sit in the low seats are going to be exalted, exactly what Jesus said. He had filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he had sent, he had sent empty away. Because God doesn't esteem riches. Remember that? God doesn't respect riches. He hath helped his servant Israel in the remembrance of history. As he spoke unto our fathers Abraham and to his seed forever, and Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. So what happened in about three months? <laughs> just, just an interesting side note. So Elizabeth was six months along. Mary stayed there about three months. She probably stayed for the baby to be born. And then she went back to her own house for the rest of her pregnancy. So the point is, Mary was blessed, she was highly favored, but even she knew that she was not the focus. I mean, she just kept repeating it over and over and over again. She had a normal marriage. She went on to have children with Joseph. In Mark 6, verse 3, I'll just read it to you. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. Jesus had many half-brothers and half-sisters that the Bible talks about. But the point is, Mary was very blessed. She was very humble. She was, she was somebody that, you know, as maybe people would say, oh, that's low self-esteem. The Bible would say that's a meek and quiet spirit, is what Mary was. And she was highly favored for that from the Lord. I mean, this woman, let me tell you something, in Acts chapter 10 and verse 25, Cornelius, he came to Peter. He came to Peter and he bowed down and Peter said, he bowed down and he started worshiping Peter. He was a man that he wanted to see the truth and he wanted to get saved and he did get saved, but he bows down and he starts worshiping Peter and Peter says, stand up, I'm a man, just as you. He's like, I'm just a man. How would Mary feel? If she knew that people were literally worshiping her today, she would not like it. She would not like it at all. It's, it's complete irony, really, because the Bible just shows us again and again and again how humble this woman is and how meek and quiet this woman is. I mean, it's true irony because, you know, the fact that she's, you know, being worshiped and being prayed to um, by, you know, Catholics and, and maybe other religions, she, she knew she was favored. She knew she was blessed. She knew she was just, she's just like the whole time, she's just like, I'm just a servant. I'm just a servant. I'm just a servant. I just, I can't believe I'm so blessed. I'm just a servant. So, I mean, the, the bottom line is, if you want to be, you say, I would like to be blessed in my life by God. All you have to do is just follow. Mary's a great example for you. Whether you're a man or a woman, all you have to do is just be abased. All you have to do is just be a servant, be abased, and God will do the exalting. And by the way, this doesn't just work with God. This works everywhere. This works everywhere. You want to be like the, you know, I would like to be, you know, higher at my company than I am now. Go to work and be the lowest servant and just, just nothing's too low for you. Be the best servant you can do. You see something on the floor. I don't care if you're the senior, whatever. Pick it up. I mean, just do the best that you possibly can. And other people will exalt you, just like God will exalt um, the lower people. Same thing at church. You're like, you know, I'd like to be uh, a leader in my church. I'd like to, you know, lead in church. Hey, be a servant. You know, be a handmaiden. This is all Mary said. It's just, I want to be a servant, and I'm just a servant, and I'm just, I, I'm, you know, I can't believe that I'm so highly favored. 
It's, it's totally ironic that people would worship her because she's one of the best examples of humility in the entire Bible, this woman. Because all she ever says is like humble things and things just exuding humility in her life. But we see this great example of how she knew the focus. Even after God gave her this huge blessing, she knew the focus was still not her. The focus was all generations. I mean, what did she say? That all generations are going to be blessed through the Lord. I mean, she's talking about the Lord in her, the Lord that did this work and blessing all generations. What a, I mean, what a great example of a Christian is Mary. You can see why God exalted her. You really can when you read her words in the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.